Ukraine has been part of Russia for more than three centuries. Uh, it was part of the Soviet Union. Uh, and in fact, because it was part of the Soviet Union, in 1954, Nikita Khrushchev made a, what then seemed a, like an act of magnanimity, but now is looked at as a terrible strategic mistake when he gifted Crimea to Ukraine as an act of solidarity, uh, which uh, the Russians later came to regret and took Crimea back in 2014. Putin wrote a very interesting article in June of this year, which he talked about the fraternal bonds, the political and cultural and ancestral ties between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and, and it's clear in Putin's mind, Ukraine is, if not part of Russia, Ukraine is closely aligned with Russia. However, the uh, US strategists have known for a while that if they can split Ukraine from Russia, then they're going to be in a position of weakening Russia. This couldn't happen during the Soviet Union, but it has happened in recent years. And I go back and I look at what Zbigniew Brzezinski, that master statesman and geopolitician, who Brzezinski, when he became Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, says, this is fabulous. I'm the first Pole in 300 years who can stick it to the Russians. And he did. And he's the one who seduced them into the invasion in Afghanistan that was so disastrous. And he did a lot of other things that I consider pretty terrible, even though some of his criticisms of George W. Bush were right on the mark. But Brzezinski, in his book, The Grand Chessboard, in 1957, writes the following, 1997, writes the following. Ukraine is a geopolitical pivot because its very existence as an independent country helped to transform Russia. Without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be a Eurasian empire. However, if Moscow regains control over Ukraine with its 52 million people and major resources, as well as access to the Black Sea, Russia automatically again regains the wherewithal to become a powerful imperial state spanning Europe and Asia. Ukraine is crucial. It wasn't just Brzezinski who got that. You look at the other neocon thinkers, uh, Libby and Hadley and Wolfowitz and the whole crew. Uh, uh, Wolfowitz, Libby and Hadley uh, understood the importance of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, they, uh, Hadley said, we had a view that without Ukraine, a retrograde Russia would never become the threat posed by the old Soviet Union because of the enormous resources, population, and geography of Ukraine. So that would become an independent and important element of US policy. From a strategic standpoint, an independent Ukraine becomes an insurance policy. This is not appreciated, and you never hear this discussed as part of what's going on there. But in 2014, well, back in 2013, uh, Yanukovych, the head of the government in Ukraine, signs a deal with the EU that effectively removes Ukraine's stat, uh, relationship to Russia and puts it solidly in the EU NATO camp without becoming a member of NATO and without formally becoming a member of the EU. Putin then made a counteroffer, much more generous, canceling a lot of Ukraine's debt, offering better energy prices. And Yanukovych breaks the deal with the Europe and signs the agreement with Putin uh, and Russia. Uh, at that point, the US neocons went crazy. And it was Victoria Nuland who goes over there and uh, maps it out. And Victoria Nuland's very important. She's a leading neocon. Her husband is Robert Kagan. It was Kagan uh, who, uh, along with uh, Crystal, Bill Crystal, uh, 
forms the project for a new American century. The project for a new American century is the neocons who take over the George W. Bush administration, give us Afghanistan, give us Iraq, give us Libya. I mean, they're the ones who have this vision for the U.S. dominating the world. So she's married to the founder of this organization. Uh, she's the one who, in consultation with the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, says, fuck the EU. They're not going to play hardball with us. And she says, let's figure out who should be the next le leader in Ukraine. And she's talking about Poroshenko and getting rid and ousting Yanukovych. Then they have the Maidan uprising and the coup takes place. And even though they had a deal in place uh, to have elections in three months that would unify the country again, and create a, a stable ongoing relationship, uh, they, ha they stage a coup and out throw out y Yanukovych, who flees to Russia. Uh, and the Russians now see that the Ukraine is firmly in the Western camp. But to back up a little bit more, it was ba go back to 1990, as you know, being in Germany, uh, it was 1990 when Gorbachev, allowed the unification of Germany. And he was promised, as he made very clear, by the United States and Germany and Britain and others, that if they allowed the unification, NATO would not expand one inch, one thumbs width to the east. Within months, NATO was planning to expand, despite the promises. But they never gave it to Gorbachev in writing. Uh, so. NATO postpones the expansion. It doesn't begin until 1998. And now NATO has expanded 13 countries to the east. But in 2008, George Bush announces, George W. Bush announces that we want to expand NATO to include Ukraine and Georgia. That was a total non-starter. Putin up to that point had been very friendly with NATO and with the West. But as the U.S. ambassador to Russia, William Burns, who's now the CIA director, Burns wrote in that memo to the White House, headlined, Niet means Niet. Don't cross Russia's red lines. Take this seriously. Don't talk about expanding NATO to include Ukraine and Georgia, especially Ukraine. Uh, but the U.S. was. And it's at that point that Russia goes into South Ossetia in the conflict with Georgia. And it's at that point that Russia's attitude toward the West begins to change. And Ben Rhodes, who was Obama's foreign policy advisor, says this in his book. He says that uh, the, the talk about Ukraine joining NATO was really when Russia's hostile attitude toward the United States and the West really gets crystallized. So we've got this history here of NATO expansion, interest in Ukraine, Ukraine being this pawn in the new Cold War. Uh, and then in 2014, after uh, the coup that takes place and Ukraine gets firmly anchored in the Western camp. And it's interesting, if you read the Financial Times coverage, very conservative British financial publication, says that uh, what happened in Ukraine was part of a years long effort by the West to wrest Ukraine away from Russia in the sense that Libby and Brzezinski were talking about to weaken Russia, make sure Russia would never pose, become a major player again on the world scene. What, what uh, Putin was suggesting was that Ukraine be anchored in both camps that it have relations with Russia and have relations with the West. Uh, and, and Ukraine, as we know, has a pretty uh, questionable history. There were, there was a very, very strong fascist pro-Nazi element in Ukraine in World War II, the Bandera forces. They are still active. They were active in the coup that took place with the Maidan uprising in 2014. And there are still militias, neo-Nazi militias operating in Ukraine. So there is, there's, so that's one element. Uh, there's also a pro-Western element that just looks at the West and sees it as, you know, looks at Germany and sees it as modern, democratic, uh, 
you know, consumer oriented, prosperous. And, and so some of them are, are more oriented toward that. There's also a big Russian speaking element in Ukraine. And so when uh, Yanukovych take, gets ousted and Petroshenko takes over, they stop allowing the use of the Russian language. Uh, they do, do a lot of other things that are going to be very hostile toward Russia. So the tension is simmering. Uh, the eastern provinces, uh, the Donbass region, two major provinces, basically effectively secede from Ukraine and align with Russia. Uh, Russia also seizes Crimea, or it doesn't seize it, it takes it back because it had given it as a gift in 1954. And Crimea is important, not only because they're Russian speaking and pro-Russian, but because that's where the big Russian port is. The Russian Navy is anchored there in Sevastopol, and they don't want to let the Ukrainian right-wingers uh, take, take over the Russian port there. So they effectively take back Sebastopol, and they have a referendum, which I think 96% of the people uh, supported unification with or rejoining Russia. The United States and the UN and the world community at large does not recognize that as a legitimate referendum. So they don't accept this. Uh, but also they accuse Russia of invading in the Donbass. They said those were Russian troops. The Russians denied that those were Russian troops. But clearly, the Russians gave a lot of military support to the secessionist forces in the Donbass. So there's been a civil war going on there for, for uh, eight years almost now. Almost about 14,000 people have been killed. There's somewhat of a ceasefire now, but the fighting still goes on almost daily at the borderline there with the threat always that the Ukrainian army is going to uh, invade that area. So with this is all the kind of the background to what's going on now. Meanwhile, uh, in the spring, Putin had put close to 100,000 troops and artillery on the border with Ukraine. And people were all up in arms that Putin might invade. And then they withdrew and they pulled them back quite a bit. They had the meet the summit between Putin and Biden in June in Geneva. And so that calmed tensions a little bit. The big issue was not so much Ukraine, the big issue was ransomware attacks. And those have re uh, been reduced from Russian soil. So they maybe made some, some slight progress on that front, and at least they were talking. Uh, but then recently, we've had the, the tension especially growing between the United States and China over Taiwan and the South China Sea. And the main focus has really been on the tension and the threat of war over Taiwan. However, the situation has been simmering. And Putin sees what's going on. And NATO has been strengthening its ties with Ukraine. There has not been real discussion, although Zelensky, before he came to Washington to meet with Biden, again started to talk about Ukraine joining NATO. The Americans have not really been talking about that, although uh, the Secretary of Defense, Austin, did bring that up again recently. So there has been talk about that. But even without Ukraine joining NATO, NATO has been strengthening ties. NATO has been training the Ukrainian army. And the US, under Trump and increasingly under Biden, has provided the kind of lethal aid to Ukraine, military aid, that Obama decided not to do. When Biden was vice president in the Obama administration, he was the US point man on Ukraine. He was meeting regularly with the neocons who were planning the strategy there, with the Ukrainian officials who was going there regularly, which is, and then his son, as we know, got involved there with the oil company. And that's what, what uh, Trump was making such a big stink about. Uh, so the Bidens were very much involved in Ukraine. So many phone conversations, visits on Biden's part. He was the brains, but Obama put constraints upon him. He did not allow Biden to have the, uh, 
uh, to send the lethal aid that Biden wanted, including some of these tow missiles that could destroy the Russian tanks. But now we give that to them. And Biden has been giving more aid to Ukraine, military aid. NATO has been strengthening ties. There is some discussion again about NATO joining. But even, what, what Putin is saying is that even if NATO doesn't, if Ukraine does not join NATO, the fact that Ukraine is, effect, is functioning as a beachhead, as an outpost for NATO increasingly, is an th existential threat to, uh, to Russia. Uh, Biden said in his foreign minister's talk in November, the Russian foreign ministry, uh, he says, I, I will repeat once again that the issue concerns the possible deployment in the territory of Ukraine of strike systems with the flight time of seven to 10 minutes to Moscow or five minutes in the case of hypersonic systems. Just imagine that. Uh, he's also talked about other US uh, military aid in, in Ukraine. And so he's now put 100,000 troops back there. US intelligence is saying that probably in January, He's going to put 175,000 troops there and that they are thinking about invading. Uh, they have no evidence that, that Putin is thinking about invading. He has not talked about invading. But this is what the U.S. and the U.S. media is projecting, that this is a direct threat to Ukraine, that Russia is going to finally resolve this, this crisis. Take it back a step again. In 2014, the U.S., uh, not the U.S., Russia... Ukraine, France, and Germany had a series of meetings in which they came up with a resolution of the crisis in Ukraine. It's called the Minsk Protocols. And this was going to be the basis for resolving the conflict there, ending the civil war, ending the fighting. And it was going to be to give the, Do the, the Donbass republics great autonomy. So they were going to be part of Ukraine again. They're going to reestablish the borders. Uh, but they were going to have a lot of autonomy. Petroshenko did not want to go along with that, even though they had agreed to it. And so they uh, decided they're not going to enforce that. Uh, and when Zelensky got elected president, Zelensky was a comic who was on a TV show in Ukraine. You know, we think of Trump as a clown. But Zelensky was also a television personality. And when he, when he ran, he talked about improving relations between Russia and Ukraine and resolving the conflict. However, by 2020, he had gone the opposite direction. And he cracks down on Russia's allies in Ukraine, shuts down the Russia-friendly television stations, uh, uh, brings actions against Medvedchuk, this big uh, oligarch who was closely tied to Russia uh, and, and, and intensifies the hostility and antagonism toward Russia. So the situation there has gotten much worse and much more tense between Russia and Ukraine. These are the building blocks that make up our organization and the goals we would like to achieve. In order to continue our journalism until 2022 and realize these values fundamental to our democracy, we need 1,000 supporters in our crowdfunding campaign, donating only 5 euros or dollars per month via Patreon or bank account. Right now we have only 200 supporters and are not able to take the next step. Our future is in your hands. Strengthen independent journalism and be part of meaningful change.